Hello and welcome to this lesson on nuclear fusion, which is part of the nuclear physics topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at understanding the process of nuclear fusion. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we should be able to describe what nuclear fusion is, calculate how much energy is released in a nuclear fusion event, and understand the conditions needed for nuclear fusion to occur, which is part of the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification. 3. 8.1.6 mass in energy. So a very small mass defect in a nuclear process can lead to a lot of energy being produced in nuclear fission. This is because mass can be considered an extreme form of potential energy via our equation delta E equals delta mc squared. Now the mass defect principle indicates that a small defect in mass leads to a large amount of energy released in the process. However, nuclear decay and nuclear fission are not processes which release the most energy per kilogram in the universe. The process which releases the most energy per kilogram of radioactive material in the universe is nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is the process of two lighter nuclei combining to form a larger, more tightly packed nucleus. This leads to the biggest mass defect possible in the universe and as such the greatest energy released. So this leads to the greatest stability increase in nuclei in the universe and as such leads to the greatest energy released. So this is the process which is currently taking place in the core of all stars in our universe. Now the change in binding energy per nucleon in a nuclear process determines if it occurs. So we can demonstrate this effect when we graph the binding energy per nucleon against the mass number. So this graph shows the elements that are most stable in the universe. The higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the nucleus is. Now iron is the most stable nucleus because it requires the most energy to remove a nucleon from the nucleus. It has the highest binding energy per nucleon in the universe. So it's in fact the most stable nucleus, the most tightly bound nucleus. So it's the aim of all elements to be as stable as possible to increase their binding energy per nucleon. Because remember that when the average binding energy per nucleon increases, the energy is released in the nuclear process. So for nuclei smaller than iron, when they fuse, the binding energy per nucleon increases, they become more stable. So we get an energy yield from this process, which we call fusion. Now for nuclei larger than iron, when they fission, the binding energy per nucleon increases, they become more stable. So that's the fission process. So you've got the isotopes below iron, which carry out nuclear fusion, and the isotopes above iron, which carry out nuclear fission. Now isotopes the lower than iron will fuse because this increases the average binding energy per nucleon of the isotope. And it's the same idea for isotopes higher than iron that they will fission. So it's important to note though that for, fu for fission, the average binding energy per nucleon increases gently for the heavier nuclei. But the average binding energy per nucleon f below iron increases rapidly. So this means that the process of fusion increases the binding energy per nucleon of the isotope at a higher rate than fission does. So this means that nuclear fusion increases nuclear stability more easily than nuclear fission. It means that the nuclear in nuclear fusion it will release more energy per kilogram than nuclear fission in a single event. So in the previous lesson we've considered nuclear fission. In today's lesson we're going to examine nuclear fusion. So what is nuclear fission? Nuclear fission occurs in elements above iron. It's when one large nucleus splits and it tends to be an induced process by firing a neutron at that nucleus. Whilst nuclear fusion occurs in elements of below iron, it's when two smaller nuclei combine and it tends to be a spontaneous process. But both events will increase the binding energy per nucleon of the nuclei and both events release energy by the mass defect principle. So fusion takes place when two nuclei combine to form a bigger, more stable nucleus. So beforehand, you've got two lighter nuclei with a smaller binding energy per nucleon, and afterwards you've got a heavier nucleus with a larger binding energy per nucleon, with the, so the nucleus is more tightly bound to the larger strong force, so it is more stable. So it's important to note that there's a larger strong force to overcome the electrostatic repulsion, so therefore the nucleons need less potential energy to exist in a stable formation, so this energy is then released in our it, from the nucleus in this process. So we can say that in this process, the mass before and the mass afterwards are not equal. The total mass of the two smaller nuclei before is greater than the total mass of the one nucleus afterwards. So this mass change is converted into energy by our equation delta E equals delta mc squared and is given out in the fusion process. But this process cannot occur with normal conditions found on 
on Earth, because this fusion process can only take place if the two nuclei are being combined at high speed. That's because you've got two positively charged nuclei in the process before. So we need to overcome the electrostatic repulsion of the two positive nuclei so we can say that they combine. Now, so we say we need energy to overcome our Coulomb barrier of repulsion. Now it's also important to know that with our heavier nuclei, a nucleus, sorry, most of the kinetic energy is released as part of the mass defect. Now some of the kinetic energy remains as the kinetic energy of the larger nucleus and the proportion depends on the size of the nucleus and the repulsion force of the original nuclei. So how do we overcome it? Well, we overcome it by having our two nuclei combine at high speed. Now we interpret this high speed of the nuclei as a high temperature. So about one MeV of kinetic energy is needed to make the nuclei fuse together. Nuclei with less kinetic energy will be deflected by the electrostatic repulsion. So for this to occur, the kinetic energy of the nuclei must not be fully converted into the potential energy of repulsion before they within about 3 times 10 to the minus 15 meters of each other. Why is it going to be that particular range? Well, at that particular range, the attractive strong force can take hold and it can attract the two nuclei together and bind them to form one nucleus. So the nuclei just need to get within the range of the strong interaction. This then takes over and pulls the nuclei together. Now, the chance of this occurring can be increased by carrying out our process under high pressure because this, will, this high pressure will make the nuclei come even closer together regardless of the kinetic energy each possesses so it's more likely for it to be within the strong force uh, interaction range so they can bind the two nuclei together so the conditions needed for fusion are as follows high temperature and high pressure now, increasing the pressure will also increase the collision rate of the process as well. So therefore, you're going to get a more likelihood of fusion taking place. Now, we should also be able to calculate the energy released during fusion by carrying out the following steps. The first step is to find the mass of the products and reactants in atomic mass units. The second step is then to find the mass defect in the process by subtracting the product mass from the reactant mass. And then finally, step three is then using an equation, convert the mass defect into the energy released. So if we put some numbers in, we can see that we can find the masses of the products and reactants in U, find the mass defect by subtracting the product mass from the reactant mass, then you can work out the energy in MeV by times by 931.3 to get into MeV, you could then convert it into joules later if you want. Now examples of fusion in the universe include two protons coming together to form deuterium, a beta plus particle, a positron, and an electron neutrino. Now the energy via mass defect released here during this fusion event is 0.4 MeV. Another example would be deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen and proton, and a proton fusing together to form helium-3. Now the energy released in this mass def by mass defect in this event is 5.5 MeV. And finally, you could have two helium-3 nuclei coming together to form helium-4 and two protons. Now the energy released by the mass defect principle here is 12.9 MeV per fusion event. Now actually, our Sun carries out all three of these processes in its core and we call this the proton-proton chain. It's the fusion chain process that occurs in all smaller stars when they turn hydrogen into helium. Now this is actually the reason why the Sun gives off a tremendous amount of neutrinos every second because neutrinos are produced in the first fission event of when we're turning our two hydrogen nuclei into our deuterium isotope. Now it's also the reason why the sun is constantly giving off energy in the form of radiation and losing its mass because the sun is losing its mass via the mass defect principle uh, to produce electromagnetic radiation. Now rather interestingly all three processes happen very quickly after each other within a matter of seconds in the core of the sun but it takes about a hundred thousand years to travel from the core to the surface of the star itself. Now as the sun carries out the three different fusion processes to produce a stable helium isotope, one chain process will release about 25 MeV. So this uh, equates to about 6 MeV per nucleon, which is a lot more than the energy released per nucleon in a fission event, which is actually why most nuclei below iron wish to carry out nuclear fusion. It's why fusion provides the most energy per kilogram in the universe. So throughout most of the sun's life cycle, energy has been produced by nuclear fusion in the core region through the steps, of the, the steps we looked at before, the proton-proton 
on chain. Only about 0.8% of the sun's energy uh, generation comes from what we call the CNO cycle, which is the fusion of heavier elements such as carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. But this proportion is going to increase as the sun becomes older. Now, the core is the only region in the sun that produces an appreciable amount of thermal energy through fusion because you need the high temperature and high pressure, which is found in the core of the, the star. So 99% of the sun's power is generated in about 24% of the sun's radius. And by about 30% of the sun's radius, fusion has stopped nearly entirely because the temperature and pressure just isn't high enough for our nuclei to combine together. Now, fusion our four free protons, our hydrogen nuclei, into a helium nucleus releases about only 0.7% of that mass as energy. But we actually do know that in the proton-proton chain, we get about 9.2 times 10 to the 37 events each second in the core. So we're converting about 3.7 times 10 to the 38 protons into helium nuclei every second, which then has a mass defect of about 6.2 times 10 to the 11 kilograms. So at this process, we're actually um, converting about 4.26 million metric tons of of he of hydrogen into helium into energy which gives us about a power rating of about 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts so in this lesson we've looked at the fusion process and we can carry out simple calculations from nuclear masses of energy released in the fusion reaction so if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson we should be able to describe what nuclear fusion is calculate how energy is released in a nuclear fusion event, and finally understand the conditions needed for nuclear fusion. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson, which has been on nuclear fusion, which is part of the AQA A-level physics topic of nuclear physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.